Well, good morning. morning. Happy Independence Day here at Church on the Rock. I see a lot of people have their festive celebration clothes on. I wore my my festive shirt too. Trying to talk my wife into getting me a new festive shirt, but she wouldn't do it. That's not true. She would do it, but I told her not to. Well, we've got um, an interesting message this morning. I'd, I'm actually really looking forward to it, and I uh, I hope that you guys like it as well. We're not re- um, video recording this morning, so I can go wherever I feel like in the church now. So if I come out and sit down next to you, don't don't be scared. Just it'll be all right. So this morning, obviously with it being Independence Day, it kind of seems fitting to speak about freedom. And God's really been changing my heart with that over the past few years, especially, um, and helping to, to really broaden my view or my perspective of what freedom really is and what God's opinion of what freedom really is. And who gives true freedom? What is God given freedom? And so, just to touch on a little bit of of American history and what we what we have come to know and love as our freedoms here in the United States is on July 4th 1776, the Declaration of Independence was adopted by the Continental Congress to declare our independence, our freedom, from Great Britain. I think we can all appreciate and thank God that he put the men uh, and women in place to allow that to come forth. Our country, even though um, there's a huge movement to push God out of the history of our country and out of the history of the men um, and women that, I say women too, because the women weren't technically allowed in these meetings, but who knows that behind every good man is a greater woman, right? That's why... I say that. Um, I, I honestly don't believe that the men that, that drafted the uh, Declaration of Independence could have done hardly anything that they did do without an awesome woman behind them. And uh, I think we all know that Betsy Ross is the one that created the, the flag that we all love, right? So, thank God for women. George Washington said, Liberty when it begins to take root, is a plant of rapid growth. Liberty, when it begins to take root, is a plant of rapid growth. That's something that that really just resonates, really stands out with me, because when people get a true taste of freedom, they get a true taste of independence, they... They appreciate it, especially if they come from a background of tyranny, a background of oppression. And so let's, uh, let's touch on what the definition of freedom is today. In the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, it says, Freedom is the quality or state of being free, the absence of necessity, coercion, or constraint, in choice or action. It's liberation from slavery or restraint or from the power of another. It's independence. The quality or state of being exempt or released usually from something oppressively burdensome. It's unrestricted. 
and it's oftentimes the quality of being frank, open, or outspoken. I guess you could say I've been free for a while. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, open our eyes to the freedom that you give us, the freedom that you freely give to us. Help us to understand it, Lord. Help us to receive it. Help us to walk in that freedom, Lord. Help us to accept it as our own and help us to freely give what was freely given to us. Amen. So what is true freedom? I'm going to do my best to answer that question for you today. And I hope that that everybody leaves here today with a maybe a different perspective. Maybe a little bit different perspective on what freedom is, on what you consider freedom. My perspective has changed over the over the years. <clears throat> John 8, 32. Guys, I'm gonna hit a lot of verses today. If uh if you can keep up flipping there, go for it. But uh what I don't want is for you guys to spend a lot of time focusing on getting to these verses and not hearing what's said between. So if you want, you can come see me afterwards and I will give you a detailed list of every verse that I hit today, okay? And I do recommend that you do take those verses and that you do go home and study them and and ask God um, if the message that I give you today lines up with his word. So John eight thirty two says... And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus started his ministry by quoting a verse out of Isaiah. Very, very, very powerful. It, uh, it really started to shake things up a little, if you will. And that verse is Isaiah 61.1. It says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to mend the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. When he said this, he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord God is what gave him the anointing, the power, the ability to proclaim this freedom to people. Yes, he was God. He is God. But he was God made flesh with fleshly boundaries, fleshly restrictions outside of the Holy Spirit. And he chose this. For a purpose. So here Jesus is starting this ministry. And the whole purpose is to proclaim freedom, to mend broken hearts, to set captives free, people that are in bondage. He wasn't talking about going into prisons and literally opening up prison gates. He was talking about something that's so much more um drastic than that, so much more deadly than that, so much more restricting than that. He was talking about the bondage that our lives are in, that our spirits are in, that our hearts are in, that our minds are in, because Satan wants to restrict you. He doesn't want you to understand that you walk in freedom and liberty, because if you do, then you're going to share that. What God has freely given you, you will freely give. And when you do that, people start to see God in you. People start to get to see an actual representation of God himself. And then they want that. They don't want to be stuck in their own bondage. 
Hebrews 2, 14 through 15, says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. What were they held in slavery of? They were held in slavery by their fear of death. Their fear of death. But when we have Christ, we don't have to fear death because we live forever. These bodies, I don't know about you guys, I don't want to take this thing with me. I used to think it was great, it's not so great anymore. It's really not. Anybody with me? Amen by myself. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Wherever He is. What does the Word say about where He is whenever you're there? It says He will never leave you. So the Spirit of the Lord is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. So there is freedom. There is liberty. Liberty. Psalms 118.5. This is a tough one. I think that probably every single person in here can relate to this in one form or fashion. Psalms 118.5 says, Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. He answered me and set me free. He answers. He answers when we call. And He wants us to call out to Him. He wants us to seek Him diligently, day and night. He wants us to seek His face. Because he, we will find him. We will find him. Acts 13, 39. And by him, everyone, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Romans six fourteen. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. And Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. <clears throat> it is the gift of God. This is a gift of God to you. That you, your salvation is a gift of God to you. But who knows that you can be saved and not operate in power? You can be saved and not operate in power. You cannot, you can be saved and not walk in your freedom. You can choose to keep yourself in bondage by not accepting the freedom that he gives you. If, if Paul and Silas, I believe it was Silas, they're sitting there in prison and the chains fall off, right? The doors open up. The angel said, get up and follow me. But who knows if they would have refused and they would have just sat there, eventually those doors would have been shut again, right? They'd still be in prison. But they chose to get up and walk in the freedom that God is giving them and telling them, come out. I've got a bigger plan for you. I've got a purpose for you. And you're going to have to walk in your freedom to fulfill it. We have to walk in the freedom that He gives us to fulfill it. We've got to know that we've got it. We've got to accept that we've got it. And then we have to walk in it. The Word tells us over and over, you have been set free. So, let's talk about some responsibilities of freedom. So we get freedom. God gives us freedom. We're set free. Here's some responsibilities. Galatians 
For you have been called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. He's telling you, this is what I want you to do with your freedom. Just a few passages back, I was talking about the freedom that he gave us that, that, that put us into a life of grace and mercy, right? And not being held under the, the weighty bondage of the law. That doesn't mean that we don't still do our best to uphold the law. It just means that he's removed that yoke from us. He's taken it on himself. He's given us a light and easy yoke. But here he tells us what he wants us to do with this newfound freedom. Here in the United States, we get to experience freedom. We get to start a business if you want. You get to protect yourself if you want. You get to have a family if you want. Have as many kids as you want. There are places in the world that you can't. You get to come through a building, the, the doors of a building that say church on it, and not be in fear of being put in prison or having your head cut off. Those are freedoms that are given to us here in the United States. But what happens if we break the laws that govern those freedoms? We get those freedoms taken away, and then we get maybe put in jail, or you no longer get the freedoms that are offered to everybody else on the same level, right? So there's some responsibilities that come along with that freedom. You don't just get to go live in somebody else's house whenever you feel like, because it's somebody else's house, you know? We've got these rules and restrictions for a reason. Like, I want to be pretty open with my stuff, but not just anybody's going to get to come on in, you know? I got to vet that person a little bit, you know? But just like here, we get to live in a free country for the most part. But with Christianity, with this relationship with God, not this religion, this relationship with God comes responsibilities. Let's talk about some of those. So if you have been called to freedom, brothers, you have been called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. He's saying you are free. But don't try to take advantage of this freedom to fulfill the desires of your flesh. That's not why you were, that's not why it was given to you. This flesh is going to be here today and gone tomorrow. It's going to rot. There's no point in trying to serve your own fleshly desires. He says in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. He's not talking about, I will not be mastered by God. He's saying, I will not be mastered by anything that could take control over my life. I can do anything. Because I've been set free through Christ. But not everything's beneficial for me. Some things are still going to hurt me. There's still cause and effect. There's still consequences for my actions. So just because I can through Christ doesn't mean I should. 1 Peter 2, 16 through 17 says, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. But live as servants of God. Now, here's four things that come after this. Live as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Fear God. Honor Him. Revere Him as God. Know that He is God. Fear Him. Not fear like, oh my gosh, I'm so scared. But honor Him. Revere Him as God, the creator of everything. And honor the emperor. The emperor was 
the emperor over, over Rome at the time. Rome was horrible, extremely horrible. It was a regime that was really, really bad. I won't get into a lot of detail because that doesn't, doesn't make that much of a difference. But what does make a huge difference is he says to honor the emperor, honor the person who gives these commands to literally burn Christians in the street. Honor this person who's taking Christians, women, children, and putting them in a coliseum to fight lions and bears and all kinds of other wild animals to watch them get torn apart for sport. But he says to honor this person. Isn't that interesting? I find it very hard to honor certain people in leadership at different times. When they make decisions that I don't agree with, I tend to go run off at the mouth to people that maybe I shouldn't be. Maybe I should be praying for that person instead of putting them down so much. You know, and, and what's one of the biggest reasons? In my mind, one of the biggest reasons is like I've said before, that God has created us, He created us, He spoke us into being, with His spoken word, which is creative. It has creative power. It has destructive power. So if we want change, we must speak forth change. We must believe that change, that God will do what He says He's going to do, that He is who He says that He is, and that we have the power and the authority that He has given us. It's His power and it's His authority coming out of our mouths. So let's start believing the power that he's giving us. Let's start believing the truth of the word that he has put right here in front of us. It's a roadmap. So I'm, I really am speaking to myself, but if it speaks to you guys as well, then good. We need to honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. If you don't like the emperor or the people that help him out, then pray for them. Pray for them. We're not always going to like everything. But we do have the answer. So, I'm talking about our responsibilities. And I just kind of covered a bunch of them. So, we know that we've been set free in Christ Jesus, that God has set us free. He's given us the true, the real God-given rights, the God-given freedoms. He's given us these true, real God-given rights and freedoms. But along with the responsibilities, now we have to understand what our role is. Our role is to now take our, our freedom that we've been given, free from sin, free from shame, free from pain, all these things that he set us free from, that the enemy's trying to put on us, death and destruction, and now we're free, and now he wants us to be servants of him, to now take ourselves and freely become slaves to him. In order to operate in this freedom, we have to become slaves. Isn't that just outside the box? Doesn't that just go against the normal train of thought? Like, I, I'm free. I thought I, thought I was free. Doesn't freedom mean I can do anything I want? You just read the definition of freedom, Nathan. No, that's not what it means. That's not what it means. 1 Corinthians 7.22, For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. That's straight out of the Word of God. That's 1 Corinthians 7.22. You were in bondage. God made you free. But if you felt like you were free before God made you free, you are a slave of Christ. But he says, 
You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. I would like to take that a little bit further. Don't become slaves of the things that enslaved you before your freedom. Walk in freedom. Walk in it. Romans 6, 18, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. You were set free from something horrible and now you are a slave of something amazing. Something better than anything you could possibly wrap your mind around. That's what he's calling you to be a slave to. Something that's going to bless you, but not just bless you, bless everyone around you. Bless everyone you come in contact with. Us here in the United States, if we go somewhere else outside of the country, we're still American citizens, right? But can you just go up and, and tell somebody on the street, now you're an American? No, because it's not going to change anything, right? They're not all of a sudden going to be an American. But you're going to stay an American. If you take yourself outside of America, you may be judged under that other place's rules, under that other place's legislation, and they might not have the same freedoms as you. Romans 6, 7 says, For one who has died has been set free from sin. Whenever I first read this, I almost didn't put it in here. Because I'm like, man, dying and being set free from sin. But my mind wasn't in the right spot. I just wasn't thinking it all the way through. Because if you think about it, the word says, for I have been crucified with Christ. When Christ was crucified, he died. He did that so that we could become free. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. What Romans 6, 7 is saying, for one who has died has been set free from sin. If you accept this freedom, you die to your old self. You've got to die to your old self and allow him to create you new. But it says, when you die, you will be set free from sin. You will be set free from sin. You know, whenever, whenever we're going through stuff and Satan's trying to sit there and lie to you and whisper in your ear, telling you that you're not good enough and that the things that you've done have separated you from Christ. And Satan's standing there telling God, Look at what Nathan did. Jesus is saying, no, my blood covers that too. My blood covers that. His blood covers me. It covers me. And what the Father sees is Nathan free from sin. Free from sin. And I want to walk that out for him. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. Whew. Did you hear that? He says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all people that I might win more of them. He's putting himself aside. Who knows that there's people out there that you'd really rather not serve. I'm so guilty of this, and I'm so sorry. There have been a lot of people in my life that God has put in my life as an opportunity for me to share him with them, and I didn't want to, and so I didn't. It was uncomfortable for me. It was inconvenient for me. It wasn't something that I felt like was something I wanted to do. But I've been set free for a reason. So that these people that maybe do things that, that I don't like, that I don't think that I want to be around, maybe if they get set free from these things, then I will like them. 
Maybe then I will want to be around them. Who knows? But they're not going to be set free if I don't operate in the freedom that God has given me, in the authority that God has given me. So he makes himself a servant to all so that he might win more of them. You know, that is our job. That's what God has put us here for, is to show people the path to get to spend eternity with God. Not to go float around on a cloud and play on a little harp, you know, like a little baby with wings. That's not what it's about. It's about the most mind-blowing, awesome, glory, amazing thing. I, our minds would never be able to wrap around it. Not till we get there. I can't, I can't wait to have my mind blown. I can't wait. It's going to be amazing. John eight thirty six. Man, I love this verse. John eight thirty six. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You will be free indeed. If the Son has set you free, you will be free indeed. You absolutely will be is what that indeed means. You 100% will absolutely be free. So the other morning, I was praying, and sometimes whenever I'm praying, God will just start to download stuff into me. You know, I'm wanting to, I'm wanting to just spend that intimate time with Him. I'm wanting to um, just be in His presence. I'm wanting to just just tell him how much I love him. And like right whenever I'm just smack in the middle of it, you know, he just starts downloading stuff into me. I'm like, oh my goodness. You know, and it's so clear. It's just like bam, 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 bam. And so I grab my notepad and I start writing down. And it's a good thing that I did because a little bit later that day or the next day, I was trying to think of what was it that God told me? And I couldn't remember what he had said. I'm like, I knew that it was for today. And I was wanting to be meditating on the word that he gave me so that I would be able to maybe present it a little more smoothly so you guys wouldn't have to um, painfully go through the process of me trying to deliver it without have been thinking about it before. But it couldn't, I, I couldn't bring it up in my mind. And so as I'm writing this down, or as soon as I'm done writing it down, I take it and I just throw it off to the side because I knew he was, that portion of time with him was done. He wasn't going to give me any more to write down. So I set it aside and I just start praying again, you know, just enjoying his presence. And then whenever I went back and I picked up the notebook later, I read through it and I'm like, oh, wow. Um, all right. And so I'm just going to read to you literally what he downloaded to me. I'm not going to embellish or add to it or anything like that. I'm not going to give my own spin on it or anything. I'm just going to tell you exactly what he said. He said he never compromises his righteousness. When he said that, he said, I, I never compromise, but it's him. He never compromises his righteousness. Therefore, because he loves us so much and desires a real and true relationship with us so much, he made a way where there was no way. He did what we could never do. He did our part for us so we could simply say yes. And now he can have us and we can have him. Yes, God the Father did send his son Jesus to die. But Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. Who here knows that when a child dies before the parent, the parent suffers the most? You see, the Father's not sadistic, God is love. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. But we are called children of God. One son willingly died so all the rest of the children could live. 
When our U.S. military or our first responders do that, we call them heroes. Yet when Jesus does it, we look at the Father and call Him cruel to put His Son through that. This must change. We must see His love, their love for us, as heroic and as the life-saving act that it truly is. They save more lives with this one act than all the rest of the lives saved before it and after it combined. Today is the 4th of July, and we're celebrating our independence because so many people chose something greater to live for and to die for so that we could experience this freedom in this country. These freedoms can be taken away from us. We're seeing that. It's being proved right in front of our eyes. But people willingly gave their lives for it, so much so that it changed the course of this country and ultimately the whole course of the world by the choices that these people made, and we call them heroes. We celebrate them. We celebrate the acts that they did on a grand scale. We go out and buy fireworks, and we blow stuff up, and we wear patriotic clothing, and we say, thank God for our God-given rights here in the United States. But what do we do for Easter when Jesus bled and died for us, gave up his life for us? We hunt Easter eggs and have commercials about bunnies and chickens and we wear cute little clothes I'm telling you Easter is so much more important not Easter resurrection Sunday Jesus's death burial and resurrection is so much more important than a country getting some freedoms for its people because these freedoms pale in comparison to the freedoms that Christ gives us, the freedoms that the Father gives us through Christ Jesus and His suffering and His heroic act. I am a patriot through and through, believe me. I'm wearing American flag socks and I've got it tattooed on my shoulder. Like, I fought for our country. I'm a United States Marine. I would gladly fight and die for it today. I'm not saying that I wouldn't. I'm not saying that anything's wrong with that. What I'm saying is, I should be so much more concerned about someone using the Lord's name in vain than I am about somebody burning a flag. I'll throw down for somebody burning a flag. I'll headbutt them right in the teeth. But I should be so much more upset when someone is coming against my God. And it's not a someone. It's a something. It's powers and principalities of darkness. And I should be dead set on destroying those dark, evil forces in my home, in my town, in my country, in my world. It should not be able to stand. When other countries are oppressing their people, we get up in arms and we go fight for them. But people are dying on a mass scale right here. And what are we doing about it? What am I doing about it? Not enough. That's what I'm not doing. I'm not doing enough. Today, today is about freedom. But today has to be about freedom from the right thing. When we're celebrating the freedom of this nation, please celebrate the freedom that Christ has given you too. And when people want to talk to you about Independence Day, July 4th, 1776, talk to them about your Independence Day, the day that you were set free from something that was killing you, something that had you in bondage, much greater, much worse than Great Britain, much, much, much worse. Because you know what? That one thing would separate you from Christ, and that one thing is separating them from the love of God. That's what's important about today, guys. That's what's truly important about today. Galatians 
It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Don't let yourselves. He wouldn't have said don't let if you couldn't let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. He wouldn't have warned us to not do it if it couldn't be done. Think about that. Mark 8.36 says, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? And I don't want to change the word. I'm not going to change the word. But I want to give you a thought that I have thought whenever I read this. What good is it to gain everything that you could possibly gain that gives you physical pleasure and then not be able to spend eternity with the one who gives true pleasure? What good is it to gain everything for this teeny tiny little moment that we live here on this planet? What good is it to have everything? To have the most freedom that you could possibly have. To do anything you wanted to do physically. Yet not be able to be free in Christ. It doesn't gain you anything. In fact, it destroys you. So I want to close with a question. Have you accepted your true freedom in Christ Jesus? Because he says that's how you get it. You believe and you accept it and then walk in it. Have you accepted your true freedom in Christ Jesus? Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. It's a day that you have made. Thank you, Lord, for the national freedom that we get to experience and enjoy. But thank you so much more, God, for the freedom that we get to enjoy because of the price that you paid for us to be able to enjoy it. Help us, God, to never, ever, ever forget that true freedom is not free. It's free to us but you paid the ultimate price for it. We were worth so much to you, God. We are worth so much to you that you came and you suffered and you took the punishment that we deserve so we didn't have to, so we don't have to. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. God, help us to accept this freedom that you freely give us. Help us to walk it out and help us to freely give it to others. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, something that's really been weighing on my heart lately a lot is that A true relationship with God comes with power. It comes with power. That is how God set it up. We are a living testimony, yes. But some people might not have an opportunity to get to know you very well and get to know your past. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit to be able to operate in power with signs and wonders. And I'm telling you, we've got to start expecting signs and wonders. We've got to start walking in the power that he has given us. And if I get up here and and teach and preach and speak, but I don't operate in power, then you have a right to question my, my ministry. So, because we are a church, we are a church body, a community, together, we are a family. It says, 
love the brotherhood. This is the brotherhood right here. You choose to be here. We're going deeper. We are going to see signs and wonders and miracles. We're starting to see them already. But this is going to be a house of power. You will see the roof blown off. You will see the building on fire burning up with the power of the Holy Spirit. Just like the burning bush where Moses is standing there and it's burning but it's not being consumed. We're going to be consumed, but we're going to be consumed by the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to expect it. I want you, whenever you feel the Holy Spirit moving in you to do something, cast off the fear, command it to go away, and start stepping out. A hundred percent of the people that we don't pray for and lay hands on will not be healed. A hundred percent of them. People will not get words of knowledge if we don't open our mouths and give them to them. God wants to use us as his mouthpiece. We are his hands and his feet. So I just want to encourage you to be expectant and to come ready. Every single Sunday, come ready. And every single time you walk out of your door, Expect God to do something with you. Don't expect the power just to be with Rod and myself and, and all the elders. This is a, it's a team effort. We do this together. We are a body. We do it together. Nothing says that I have the power to do it and you don't have the power to do it. They're called gifts of the Spirit for a reason. They're given to you to be able to utilize. So expect it. We're going to close with a song, and if you have anything that you need prayer for, um, come on up. If you don't want to come up or you, whatever, raise your hand. We'll come back to you, and, um, and we'll just expect God to do big things. If you haven't accepted the, uh, the free gift of freedom that God has given you, today's the day to accept it and start walking in it. All right. Love you guys.